All right, this is going to be a review of the different dose reduction techniques and technologies that are used in CT imaging. This will have application both in, in cardiac and non-cardiac CT. Uh, we're going to start out by talking a little bit about just what it is that makes up CT image quality because it's important to pay attention to your image quality when reducing the dose because you have to maintain diagnostic quality. Otherwise, we're exposing the patient to radiation uh, for no reason since uh, if we don't maintain the quality to be diagnostic, then uh, we'll have shot ourselves in the foot. Uh, and after that, we're going to take a look at all these different parameters of CT imaging and see how we can change them in order to optimize the patient dose while maintaining that diagnostic image quality. So, <clears throat> By way of review of the different factors that contribute to image quality, there's three primary factors that taken together are an overall determinant of image quality. These are noise, contrast, and resolution. Um, by understanding exactly how you quantify each of these things, we can see how reducing the dose using the different strategies that we'll talk about in the second part of the talk um, alters the different parameters so that we can make sure that we keep our images of sufficient diagnostic quality. So first, noise. Um, noise is quantified in terms of standard deviation and we perceive it as quantum model. These are little random variations in the uh, perceived attenuation uh, that you'll see in your image itself. Noise is related to the dose of your CT technique. Um, specifically, it is related inversely to the MA. Um, this is the MA, remember, is an expression of really the number of photons that are exposed to your patient um, and that are incident upon the detector. So if we, re if we quadruple the MA, then the dose, excuse me, if, qu if we quadruple the dose in terms of the MA, then the actual noise is cut in half. Um, <clears throat> another parameter that will affect the MA and subsequently the noise is the patient size. Remember if we have a patient that is twice as big then a greater percentage of your x-ray beam is going to be attenuated before it hits the detector. So as far as the detector knows it's dealing with a reduced MA which will serve to increase the amount of noise that you get. Uh, furthermore, once you have your data the reconstruction algorithm that you use to generate your images can have an effect on the perceived noise and we'll see some examples of this. So here we have three different images, three different techniques that are done um, in acquiring a phantom. On the top row we can see the overall image of the phantom and we've got an ROI. If we look at the low dose or the 10MA technique on the left hand side of the screen we can see that the standard deviation there is about 19 Hounsfield units. So this is giving us an idea of just how many levels of density are varying between the darkest pixels in the noise pattern. That's the result of the quantum model that we see and the, the relatively brighter pixels. If we go to the 40MA technique we can see that that standard deviation has actually reduced to about 10 Hounsfield units. <clears throat> and again this matches, remember we've, we've quadrupled our MA and our noise has actually been cut in half. So then if we just take it all out and we go to 640MA we can see that <clears throat> the standard deviation has dropped down to three Hounsfield units and if we look at the images on the lower half of the screen we can see that that perceptible quantum model pattern that we see on the 10 MA just gradually reduces at the 40 MA technique and is almost completely imperceptible at the 640 MA and you can see that you know we want our images you know as radiologists we're used to and we want to have good diagnostic uh, quality without that quantum model pattern but we have to remember that there's the trade-off of radiation dose. 640 MA is going to be a significantly higher dose to our patient than the 10 MA. So it's a trade-off that we have to keep in mind when we think about how we reduce our technique. Now we talked a little bit about how the reconstruction algorithm actually has an effect on your noise as well. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of the same data set that is reconstructed with two different filters or two different reconstruction algorithms. On the left we have the soft tissue kernel and on the right we have the bone kernel. Just when you look at the images you can perceive that there is a different quantum model or noise pattern 
that you should be able to detect when you look especially at um, areas that are relatively homogeneous. Um, and this can be manifest or quantified objectively by looking at the standard deviation of your ROI. On the left we can see that the standard deviation is 7.4 Hounsfield, um, Hounsfield units and on the right it's all the way up at 55 Hounsfield units. Now this is an example where there was no difference in the dose that the patient received. This was simply the difference in the mathematical algorithm that we applied to our original sinogram data in order to get this reconstructed image. Uh, we'll see that um, <clears throat> this actually also changes another parameter of our image quality, specifically the resolution, but uh, we have to keep in mind that it, it affects the noise as well because when we look at tissue contrast, we can see that that's primarily determined by our noise. <clears throat> so this brings us to the next uh, parameter that is a determinant of CT image quality, and that is resolution. Keep in mind that resolution is quantified by the ability to resolve two small high contrast objects. It's expressed in terms of spatial frequency by the modulation transfer function, or MTF, and there are a number of things that determine resolution in CT. First of all, you have your system geometry. Now, these are the technical parameters of the scanner itself. They include the focal spot size, the detector dimensions, as well as uh, your ray sampling technique as the gantry rotates. Uh, on top of that, when you actually perform your image reconstruction from the source data to your um, image that you're going to make, the FOV that you choose, the field of view, as well as your matrix size, uh, which is pretty standard across all CT, uh, determine exactly how small an object you can resolve. On top of this, the reconstruction algorithm that you choose, whether it's soft tissue or bone or lung, um, is also going to affect your ability to resolve two small objects or your image resolution. Um, you, you generally have a high tolerance to noise for high contrast structures. Uh, as a result of this, you know, noise is, is you have uh, quite a bit of breathing room in noisy images for high contrast structures. This is because the relative difference of attenuation that you'll see in your quantum model pattern uh, remember, we saw some standard deviations that were on the order of 9 or 55, so that was kind of the level of variation that you saw. That level of variation is going to be dramatically small compared to the intense difference of density that you'll see, for example, between bone and the fat that is interspersed uh, between the trabecula of bone. So, um, <clears throat> so the resolution is really not going to as dramatically be affected by your noise. So let's see an example of that. Here we have two images side by side. Again, it's the same data, the same technique uh, for the actual acquisition, but when we reconstructed, we used a different filter. On the left, we have our soft tissue kernel, and on the right, we have the bone kernel. So if we look at the soft tissue image, you can see that you really lose the detail of the bony trabecula for this part of the base of the skull. If you compare that with the image on the right, you can see that um, the fine septations of the trabecula are very perceptible, and you can see the areas of fat density that are in between the trabeculations. So our ability to resolve those areas of, of thin bony trabeculation is um, possible on the bone kernel. We have a superior spatial resolution, whereas on the soft tissue kernel, we really lose that. But Keeping that in mind, if we look at the bone kernel image itself, you can see that there is a more pronounced quantum model pattern or noise pattern over the whole image, so there's a little bit of a trade-off there. But uh, keep in mind that the spatial resolution will be affected by your reconstruction algorithm, and these two images exemplify that. Uh, finally, we come to image uh, or tissue contrast. So, this is quantified by our ability to perceive an object which is very close in attenuation to its background. Um, this is more challenging to quantify objectively, and we generally perceive it as a subjective um, ability to tell two different densities apart that are close together. This, for example, becomes very important when you're imaging the brain and you want to be able to see that very subtle difference between the gray matter and the white matter. Um, <clears throat> so contrast is determined by 
noise, resolution, and the window level settings. And in particular, it's affected by noise. And we can see some examples of that. Here we have two phantoms uh, done with two different techniques. On the left-hand side, we have a slightly less noisy image than on the right-hand side. And if we look at the 12 o'clock position on the, on the image on the left, you can see that there is a round circular area of relative hyperdensity. And if we compare our ability to perceive that structure to the image on the right that has a great deal more noise, we can see that it's harder to perceive that. Now moving in counterclockwise direction, you can see that there are actually groups of about four additional progressively smaller dots that you can just make out on the image on the left, but I'm really hard pressed to make those smaller structures out on the image on the right. So this is an example of where an increased noise pattern actually dramatically impairs our image contrast, which has an effect on our ability to perceive subtle differences of density. So you can imagine that particularly if we were looking for something for which finding subtle um, densities is important. For example, looking for liver metastases, looking for brain lesions, or looking for subtle areas of edema within the brain. Suddenly, the amount of noise can have a, a very significant effect on our ability to have diagnostic imaging. So we want to be very careful about how we reduce our technique in those particular applications to make sure that we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. All right, so let's take a look now at the steps to image production uh, because we need to take, you know, at, at each different point here, we can try to find uh, a way to, to optimize our technique. So we have uh, an example here of our, our gantry, the large circle. We have our x-ray source, which we see as that small dot at the 12 o'clock position, and we're seeing kind of a shadow that is showing the cone beam of our x-ray. Uh, now we're going to place our patient in the area of um, our, our beam. And we have our detector at the far end of the beam. So we can imagine that um, you know, before the beam reaches the patient, it is of a certain intensity. As the beam passes through the patient, a certain percentage of the photons of that beam are going to be absorbed or scattered. And then what our detector perceives will be an overall reduction um, and it's that, you know, the different levels of reduction that give us the density map that we use to reconstruct our images. Uh, that image processing is done by a computer that you'll see at the workstation or in a room adjacent to your CT scanner. And once we've taken that source data and reconstructed it according to the algorithm that we choose and the field of view that we choose, the image is then displayed. So, <clears throat> the different parameters that go into x-ray production. Well, well, first we have the the tube current or the MA. Um, this is a parameter that we use that is kind of analogous to you know how many photons or it, specifically it is how many photons are um, put into the production of the x-ray that eventually go to make up your image. It has a linear relationship to dose. What this means is that if you double the MA, you're going to double the dose. And conversely, if you cut the MA in half, then the dose is going to be cut in half as well. But it does have an inverse relationship to noise, which means that if you cut the MA in half or cut the, the dose in half, uh, that you're actually going to increase your noise by about 40%. So keep this in mind as we look at how we change our technique, that while we could simply cut the MA, that's going to have an adverse effect on the amount of noise that we have. <clears throat> All right, so knowing this now, it's important to keep in mind that you know, for a given technique, if you pay attention to what exactly you're imaging or what you're interested in, you could potentially reduce the dose used in your CT but still maintain diagnostic imaging. What does this mean? Well, let's say that you have a given technique and you image a large patient and that gives you diagnostic imaging. If you then image a smaller patient, for example, a pediatric patient with the same technique, then that patient is not going to attenuate the beam as much. And so all of the extra dose that you would be giving the patient 
because you optimized your technique for the larger patient, all of that extra dose is going to waste. What does it mean it's going to waste? Well, it means that your, no your CT image will be much less noisy, but we already determined that we had sufficient diagnostic imaging at the level of noise for the larger patient. So if we image a smaller patient, we could subsequently reduce our dose and keep that same noise level that we already know is diagnostic, but save the patient all of the additional radiation. On top of that, as we image parts of the body that are less dense, we're going to see less attenuation of the beam. So if our CT could somehow realize that, for example, when we image the chest where a great portion of the volume is made up of air, if we could reduce the MA during that part, we could still maintain an adequate level of noise and diagnostic imaging, but save the patient radiation. Furthermore, um, if we realize that you know people's body and cross-section are not a perfect circle, they are an oval, what that means is that the beam will have longer or a further distance to travel as it's going from left to right than it will as it's going from front to back. So we could essentially reduce our dose as the beam is going from front to back and then take it back up to, di to full technique as it's going from left to right. And we'll see some schematic examples of that in just a minute. So <clears throat> what is this that we're talking about? Well, we're talking about the scanner's ability to automatically change its dose in something that uh, has been referred to as a form of automatic exposure control. We know automatic exposure control from conventional radiography where we have a photo timer that sees how many photons it's received and once it hits a threshold it turns off the camera. Well in CT it's a little bit differently. We use something called dose modulation and this is where there's an automat automated alteration of the MA by taking patient geometric and physiologic factors into account, allowing reduction of current while maintaining constant image quality or a constant noise level. Now each of the vendors has come up with their own fancy name um, for what is essentially uh, similar um, strategies to do this. GE has auto MA, Siemens has the care dose 4D, Toshiba has sure exposure, and Philips has dose right. But it's important to realize that all of these are just a form of automatic exposure control or dose modulation. So let's see exactly what's happening. Here we have an example of uh, a patient that's going to be scanned. Um, and we have in our x-axis on a graph the tube position, and then, and then in our y-axis we have the MA. So let's see what we do. If we were to scan conventionally, uh, we would keep our MA at the same dose throughout the entire part of the patient. Now if we look at some examples of images from different parts of the body, we can see that at the shoulder girdle, uh, things are quite dense. As we get to the chest, we can see a lot of the volume is actually made up by air within the lungs. Within the abdomen, we can see it's primarily soft tissue, and then as we get to the pelvis, there's again a lot more bone that contributes to the volume. Um, <clears throat> But let's let's take a look at our patient. Now that we have kind of an average size patient here, what were to happen if we subsequently imaged a thin patient? Well, remember a thin or a smaller patient is going to attenuate much less of the beam. And so suddenly we're, if we stay at the same technique, we'll have all of this overhead of radiation. Our images will have much less noise, but remember at that higher noise level we were still getting diagnostic imaging. So if we could further reduce our MA just because we know we have a smaller patient, then we can have lower radiation exposure to the patient while maintaining the same noise level in our images or the same image quality. So by adjusting our technique or our dose to the size of the patient, we're able to optimize our technique and still maintain diagnostic image quality. Next. What about uh, scout attenuation? So we talked about different strategies that the scanners have to determine how to vary the dose. Uh, one method that the vendors may use is taking the scout image itself, and remember the scout image is essentially an average intensity projection of the volume of the patient. It will look like an x-ray, um, but what it is, it's a map of density. So the scanner can take each different position on the z-axis of our patient and say, okay, this patient is about this dense at this particular point. And it could create a map of that over the whole patient. If we see that, we can see that um, you know, the average density at each point along this z-axis is not the same throughout the whole patient. It drops dramatically over the lungs and then comes up again over the body and the pelvis. So now that the, the CT has this data from the scanner, it can use it to modulate the dose throughout the scan itself.
So here we have, again, our phantom, or our, our ideal patient. We have just some images that show you know, what, what the actual tissue is at each point. And we've already taken that scout image. The scanner has the data. And now it knows how it can adjust the MA to keep about the same noise level through the whole acquisition itself. And so we can see that our graph is uh, further adjusted as a result of that. All right, so what else can we do? Well, there's another thing we have to keep in mind. Um, about how a CT scan is acquired. We know that uh, we reconstruct our images by taking multiple projections around our patient or around our phantom. And we also realize that at each angle that the beam is projected, um, there's going to be the patient in between the beam and the projector, and depending on what angle you're at, whether you're going front to back or left to right, the beam has a different distance to travel through the patient's body. And if we look at the attenuation that you would expect to see as you travel around in that 360 degree rotation, we can see that the attenuation goes up as we go left to right and is relatively lower as we go front to back. This is because of the oval shape of the patient themselves. So now that we know that, we could further instruct our CT scanner to change the MA to take this into account. This will help us to really optimize how we are doing our technique while maintaining diagnostic imaging quality. So we have an example here of the beam at its zero degree position where it's going front to back. And then we also see where it's at its 90 degree position where there's a great increase in the distance that the beam has to travel. And we can see as we look in our graph what we have, if we look at the zero degree point, we have a certain attenuation. If we look at the 90 degree point, it's quite a bit larger. So now let's apply this to an actual patient. So if we were to look at that, we can see that uh, the matching the relative dose of our technique to where the scanner is along its rotation will look somewhat like a sine wave because that's what you get when you have a um, you know a circle that you're going through all of those degrees but because we've done this we've kept our noise profile the same throughout the acquisition and this is something that uh, we can do to further optimize the radiation dose while keeping about the same noise level and maintaining the same image quality so what if we were to combine all of these different techniques together? Well, we can see here that if we combine that attenuation that we got, the attenuation data we got from the scout with the rotational attenuation data that we know we have, then we get what looks like, uh, you know, kind of a, a noisy squiggle. But what this is doing is taking all the different pieces of information that we got from looking at exactly how we were scanning our patient and doing everything we can to optimize the dose by looking at just these particular parameters. So how do we figure out that attenuation difference? Well, when they first started applying this strategy, they, they would use the scout image. And so um, they could, um, you know, all of that information was, was determined uh, on the initial part of the study before they actually did the acquisition. Well, computer systems are fast enough now where they can actually look at the data as they acquire it and modify that attenuation on the fly. Um, because uh, they can use the data from the last rotation to determine the technique for the next rotation. So this allows the technique to be optimized to the finest granularity for each patient. All right, so we've talked about different ways of looking at how we acquire our image, how we look at the patient size in order to uh, optimize dose. W what about special applications? The, the strategies that we've talked about so far can actually be applied to any technique that you're using um, <clears throat> but if we look now at the special application of the heart, uh, we can see that there are further strategies that we can use to identify uh, ways to further optimize our dose. Now, uh, the first and um, initial strategy that was used was something called retrospective ECG modulation. What is this? Well, we recognize that in imaging the heart, um, the heart is moving while we're trying to acquire our projections that we'll eventually use to reconstruct the data. Um, in cardiac CT, as you'll cover in your, in your cardiac CT lectures, 
um, the way that we overcome the motion is we have tracers or we have leads attached to the patient so that the computer knows at what point in the cardiac cycle the patient is for every piece of data that it acquires and we scan at a pitch that is so low that we actually oversample every piece of tissue uh, in our z-axis. What this means is that we've we've imaged over every portion of the heart multiple times so we've caught it at various different levels throughout the cardiac cycle. We can then after we've acquired our data go back and we can throw out all the data except for when the patient was for example at 70 percent of the time between the R to R intervals. And we can choose whatever cycle we want throughout the heart in order to do that. But it turns out that when you look at the heart cycle itself, there's motion during quite a bit of the heart cycle. Certainly when it's actively contracting, you have motion, which is going to degrade image quality. Um, and if you look at the whole cardiac cycle, the portion of the cardiac cycle that has the least motion is at end diastole. That's where the left ventricle has, has relaxed and is filling, and it's right before you have that systolic contraction. That's where you have the widest temporal window in which there's relatively little cardiac motion. It turns out if you measure from R to R interval, it's at about the 70%, 70, 75% of that distance. So we know that that is the sweet spot for, um, for cardiac imaging. So what if we were able to, I guess we have to go back and say, you know, if we went and did the full dose throughout the cardiac cycle, we would probably not use the data for simple diagnostic imaging of the coronary arteries, not use the data throughout a majority of the cardiac phase. And as a result, we wouldn't need to have the beam at that full intensity whenever, the comp whenever your scanner recognized that the patient was not at that sweet spot throughout the cardiac cycle and diastole period. And so this is an, a diagram that shows the ECG tracing. You can make out your QRS complex. And then we have a darker blue line which shows how we turn up the technique. This line represents the MA. We're turning up the technique at that sweet spot, at that end diastolic spot. This is going to let us have images with much less noise on the diagnostic window of end diastole, but then throughout the rest of the cardiac cycle there'll probably be a great deal more noise, but that's fine because there's also going to be motion artifact and other things that will degrade image quality. We just want to make sure that we have uh, sufficient technique for the end diastolic window. So what if we were to take this a step further? Since we've already acknowledged that um, the sweet spot is that diastolic window where there's the least amount of cardiac motion, for most coronary imaging, we really aren't going to be using the other phases of the cardiac cycle, the systolic phase, for example, where there's going to be all that motion artifact. Well, instead of just reducing the beam intensity during that time frame, what if we were just to turn the beam off altogether so we were really only radiating the patient during that sweet spot, during the end diastolic window. This would affect an even greater dose savings. So <clears throat> this brings us to a third strategy, and that is, well, we've had to do our oversampling using a relatively low pitch of, you know, significantly less than one in retrospective cardiac CT. Well, Siemens came out with a, a unique way of cardiac imaging that included using two different x-ray sources and two different detectors at 90 degrees from each other. The, these de sources and detectors can actually image simultaneously, so you actually acquire um, a, a greater amount of data for each rotation. Uh, what this ultimately allows you to do is actually image at a significantly higher pitch for a faster examination, but still acquire using the same um, imaging quality. So this is a schematic example where you can see kind of the the tracing of where the detector and where the beam is as it rotates around the patient. We can see here that as the patient moves through the gantry, we can see the shadow of where the um, the beam was and there are no gaps in the coverage. 
um, this would be at a pitch of about one where your collimation width is about the same as your table speed so there's no gaps and there's no overlap in how you're scanning the volume of your patient this is going to be kind of a standard or slow table speed compared to if you increase your pitch to greater than one so at a pitch greater than one you can see that we've now moved the patient a greater distance through the gantry than the width of the collimation and what that produces is gaps in coverage um, <clears throat> Now keep in mind we're still imaging the whole volume of the patient but we're undersampling. The computer is going to extrapolate a little bit and this could produce artifact in our reconstructed images which may appear as smudging or blurring uh, in different areas. Um, but in general you're able to image faster so if you could somehow capture a higher pitch but overcome this under sampling so that you don't introduce artifact then you'd have the benefits of a, a faster acquisition and this is what they're able to accomplish with dual source spiral CT the second head is able to actually image in those areas which were not covered by the first head in a higher pitch acquisition this allows them to scan faster they can capture the entire volume of the heart in the space of a single heartbeat and um, allows them to further since they no longer have to do the oversampling over multiple heartbeats you can dramatically reduce the dose of your CT acquisition for cardiac imaging <clears throat> So we've looked at how to modify our technique based on the parameters of the scanner, on the parameters of the patient. We've looked at how to take advantage of the fact that we really are going to primarily get our diagnostic data from the end diastolic phase of the heart. And so if we can just image during that sweet spot and not throughout the rest of the heart cycle, we can further save radiation dose. Well, what about looking at the actual tissue that we're imaging and acknowledging that certain tissues have a greater sensitivity to radiation and as a result if we could selectively reduce dose when we were imaging over those areas of the body um, then we could maintain diagnostic imaging quality while saving those radiosensitive tissues and the primary tissue that we look at in this case is breast tissue so we are rotating our gantry around the patient but we know that the greatest absorption and the greatest exposure to our patient is going to be at the skin and it's going to be at the skin closest to where the radiation source is which will be moving with the gantry around the patient so if we tell the computer to procedurally reduce the technique, reduce the MA as it passes over the front part of the patient, then we can selectively reduce the exposure to the breast and if we reconstruct this data we can see that you still can maintain a fairly decent uh, image quality while saving a significant radiation dose to the breast. And so if we're able to select those female patients that are susceptible, apply this strategy, then we can further optimize our technique. So we've looked at a number of different strategies to, to tweak with our technique and change the MA in order to um, optimize our radiation exposure to our patient while maintaining diagnostic quality. Well, what other parameters of our scanner can we change? Well, remember that for any radiation source that we create in medical imaging, we have two parameters at least, and that is the MA as well as the KVP or the energy of the beam. So normal CT scanning that we've traditionally performed has been at 120 KVP. Um, you can further reduce your tube current to 100 or even 80 kVp. Now it's not as intuitive what this does to the exposure to the patient as MA is. MA is you cut the the dose in half if you cut the MA in half it's a linear relationship. It's not quite linear when you talk about altering the kVp. Because decreasing the voltage of your x-ray beam to 100 brings it closer to the k-edge of your iodinated contrast tissues it actually increases the relative attenuation of IV contrast um, so for particular applications such as vascular angiography such as CTA or, or 
or other angiographic exams, this may actually be a desired effect because we're able to further distinguish contrast-filled vessels from background tissue. There is going to be an effect in noise. Um, there will be somewhat of an increased noise and as a result some of the scanners will actually increase the MA a little bit but overall you can actually get an effective reduction in dose. Now keep in mind that when you have a patient that's so large that they're going to dramatically attenuate the, the MA um, just by nature of their physical size, it's going to overcome any benefit that you would get from reducing your, the energy of your beam. So for large patients, we still select to keep our uh, technique still at that higher 120 kVp. So look at some examples of that. Now this in particular for coronary imaging has been a way to further reduce radiation dose. We have three images here from uh, three different acquisitions. The first one on the left hand side is at 120 kV energy and our MA is at 330. This gives us a mean density in the, in the aorta of 320 Hounsfield units and our CTDI that the scanner tells us for this acquisition is at 43 milligray. So then if we look at our middle one, this is at that lower KV. So we've cut our KV, our energy, down to 100. And now let's look what that did to the relative attenuation of the aorta. We can see that the, the scanner perceives the aorta attenuation at 560, so it actually perceives a, a more dense. Now, this can't be a real true comparison because there's too many variables such as, you know, just the injection the the patient's cardiac output. There's a lot of things, but if the techniques were similar enough, um, you could see that this would be an an increase in the perceived density there. And that if we look at the CTDI, which is kind of a predictor of the overall dose of our technique, it's actually dropped um, a good 25 percent to 32 milligray. And let's now, in addition to dropping our energy, let's drop the energy and the MA. So in our third image, we've dropped the, the energy to, to 100 kV, and we've dropped the MA down to 230. What has this done to our CTDI? Well, it's further uh, decreased that in size. So now we're at 50% of the technique from our first image, and we still maintain that relative good density of the aorta itself and subsequently the coronary artery, but we've cut our dose in half just by changing these technical parameters and you can see that you're still able to perceive the coronary artery quite beautifully and you can tell even far out distally that that artery is quite patent. So we just explored ways to alter your technique and your parameters of your protocol to uh, optimize radiation dose. Well, what can we do after the acquisition itself to try to uh, optimize dose? And this is where we're seeing some new strategies that are really exciting because things like retrospective cardiac gating and lowering the, the um, KVP, those are protocol specific strategies. You know, ECG modulation is not going to help if you're doing a CT scan of a, of a pediatric patient looking for appendicitis um, because that's not dependent on the cardiac cycle. But if we could find a way to do a better job of reconstructing our images from the source data so that we ended up with an effective less degree of noise, then that would allow us to further reduce our technique in terms of MA and still achieve diagnostic imaging while affecting a uh, relatively decreased amount of radiation exposure to the patient. So if we so enter the next phase of uh, dose reduction strategies and that is that of iterative reconstruction. So using iterative reconstruction we can improve signal to noise ratio using a new computational algorithm for image reconstruction. Essentially what we do is we produce a higher signal to noise for a given technique. This allows us to reduce technique across many different protocols while still producing images with the signal to noise ratio that we are accustomed to for diagnostic imaging. So let's look at some examples of what this means in practice. So this is an array of images. This is all from the same source data. If we, you know, start with a basic filtered back projection, this is the image in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, we can see that we have a fairly uh, pronounced noise pattern. 
and um, you know for looking at subtle soft tissue lesions this would probably not be diagnostic perhaps if you're trying to look at high contrast things such as lung parenchyma or bone you could rewindow this and still get um, diagnostic imaging well if we apply um, some basic um, you know commonplace strategies that um, you know have been incorporated in scanners and get kind of a weighted filtered back projection we can see that we've improved our signal to noise ratio here with the same data set and this is kind of the level of imaging that we're accustomed to with our traditional scanners up until this point well if we start looking at if you take this same volume set and apply iterative reconstruction to it you can see under the theoretical iterative reconstruction in the upper right hand corner statistical iterative reconstruction in the lower left hand corner and um, different vendor specific strategies um, that apply the same principle of taking your source data and using a different algorithm to reconstruct it different than simple filtered back projection we're able to actually get an image that is produced with a significantly um, lower s um, noise pattern or a higher signal to noise ratio now <clears throat> if you've trained and you've done all of your um, you know prior years of imaging looking at a particular quantum model signature of your CT scanner it can actually be a challenge to look at these smoother you know less noisy images and some people have actually reported feeling like they were maybe losing detail because the images looked so plastic so um, some of the vendors have actually tried to find a way to allow somewhat of a, a more natural quantum model pattern still persist while you know trying to maintain a certain degree of, of, of benefit for tissue contrast and I think that as we start to get um, newer and faster ways of doing this and start training younger residents to be accustomed to these uh, images that are um, you know of a different level of noise then that may not be as uh, as much of a challenge but we'll see how that plays out in the future so this has been kind of a whirlwind tour through all the different parameters that are involved in x-ray production and how we can pay attention to what we're imaging and alter things to reduce our technique and subsequently reduce our dose as much as possible while maintaining those features of image quality that allow us to to keep diagnostic imaging